Hello, and welcome to Past, the podcast about those who would never rule. I'm Veronica Fortune, and this week's episode is... Robert Kurthose, Part 2. We left our story last week, as Kurthose was preparing to leave for the First Crusades. I thought I'd give you a short recap. Robert Kurthose was the oldest son of William of Normandy, who had been usurped, or passed over, in 1087 by his younger brother, William Rufus. His failed rebellion in 1088, led to the brothers declaring each other their heir. And in 1096, Curthouse began preparing to join the pilgrimage that would become the First Crusade. Curthouse and his army of 6,000 departed in September 1096. Most of the journey would be done on foot or horseback at a slow pace. Some who traveled with the army did so to get to various cities, including Rome, under the protection of said troops. Not everyone was going to fight. Pack animals, war horses, livestock, and people move slowly, even along well-maintained roads, and they would not be getting to those for a while. Count Stephen of Blois and Robert of Flanders, Curthouse's brother-in-law and cousin, respectively, joined his group in Pontalia. From here, the larger group would travel over the Alps. This portion of the journey was very dangerous due to extreme cold. Less than 150 years earlier, Elsig, the Archbishop of Canterbury, froze to death crossing the Alps due to mistiming his trip. It does appear the Crusaders planned their crossing well. The route they traveled was one of the safer ones and had access to hostels along the crossing. In mid-October, they reached Lucca and were met by Pope Urban. Curthouse and the other leaders received his personal blessing, and they would all reach Rome by mid-December. I will cover the situation in Rome at this time in my year of the antipopes, as mentioned earlier. But to describe it as a mess would be an understatement. The Pope couldn't even get into St. Peter's due to the anti-Pope having taken up residence there. From Rome, Curthouse's group would continue south to Bari, a coastal city and the crossing point to the Balkans, where the Byzantines would be waiting to escort the Crusaders to Constantinople. In Bari, the larger Norman and French army was joined by a smaller southern Norman army, made up of the Normans of Sicily, led by Bohemond of Toronto. Bohemond's birth name was Mark, but the super K was fitting. He was an actual giant of a man. Prior to Curthouse's arrival, Hugh of France, the brother of King Philip I of France, had crossed, losing many ships in the process and barely making it himself. Curthouse, Stephen, and Bohemond, who of the three knew the area the best, decided to wait until spring to make the crossing. Their decision wasn't lazy or cowardly, as chroniclers have suggested. It was prudent and the local sailors didn't want to take any further trips. There are probably two reasons chroniclers would use this as a chance to take a shot at Curthouse. First, Robert of Flanders was able to pay the locals enough for them to take him across and was successful. The second is who stayed behind with him. Count Stephen's later actions will not reflect well on him, his family, or his companions. But no one knew that at this time. Having a coward for a companion is never a good look, even if you don't know they're a coward at the time. Over winter, Curthouse likely spent time with a local count, Geoffrey of Conversano, and his daughter, Sybil. His enjoyment in making this lady's acquaintance would have been tempered by the loss of his uncle. Odo died after a brief illness in Sicily. In April 1097, Curthouse's army, along with his fellow Normans and Stephen, reached Durazzo. They were escorted along the Via Ignatia and reached Constantinople in mid-May. It appears that overwintering had been a good call. Other than Hugh's disastrous sea journey, the army under Raymond of Toulouse was dealing with a breakdown in discipline and fighting with their host forces after a difficult overland crossing in winter. The emperor, Alexis I, had appealed for the Crusades to come help protect his city, and in moving to take back Jerusalem, take some of the pressure off of his empire on the Anatolian side of the Bosphorus. He didn't seem to realize that calling for thousands of armed men to come help his cause would mean there would be thousands of armed men in his capital. The movement of men from the European side of his capital to the Asian became a carefully choreographed dance to keep rival leaders away from each other, lest fights break out and allies from joining up against him. Alexis would meet with each army's leaders while the men would camp outside of the walls, being escorted in as needed in small groups. Oaths would be given, gifts exchanged. Curthouse did spend a bit longer with Alexis. William's son is regularly described as friendly, 
personable and easygoing by all historians. Once these pleasantries were over, Alexis would ship the armies across to Anatolia to begin their actual crusading. Alexis's decision to keep armed men out of his city and to send them on their way as quickly as possible was a smart one, as the Fourth Crusades will show. <laughs> Quick interjection here, it again. I really don't like discussing battles. I find troop movements, the taking of battlements, skirmishes, super boring. I know some people love to talk about all the details of a battle, but that's not for me. So I'll be giving a general outline of events without going into the finer details. If you're interested in a show about battles I skip over, let me know. I'll convince my husband to start one if we get enough interest. By June, Kurthos and the other leaders had formed up outside of Nicaea. They numbered up to 60,000. The city was taken by mid-June. From there, the army would cross Anatolia. Their timing was pretty poor. While not a desert in the constantly hot sense, Anatolia is known for its extreme summer heat and dryness. Water and food was not always easy to come by. In addition to the weather, the Crusaders were dealing with an area of extreme elevation changes. They followed the inland route, and there were regular skirmishes with the Turks in the area, as would be expected when invading. The politics of the Crusades is something we rightly look down on today. To most secular individuals in modern times, the idea is appalling, but at this time, it was a holy mission. It's also important to remember that while most Turks in Anatolia and the Fatimids in Jerusalem were Muslim, many citizens of the smaller cities along the route were Christian. Larger cities often had a mixed population that included Jews. There were cities that opened their gates for crusaders, and even those who killed their garrisons to help the crusaders. The trip through Anatolia was long, and the city of Antioch wasn't even taken until June 1098. The day before it was taken, Stephen of Blois fled to the coast, deserting his men and his holy vows. He would eventually be excommunicated, his sentence not being lifted until he joined the Second Crusade and fulfilled his vows. On the 3rd of June, Bohemond, Robert of Flanders, and Kurt Host planned and led the attack that would take the city. Following this win, they themselves would be besieged for three weeks until they finally held the city decisive. The crusaders stayed in the city until January 1099. Resting through summer, autumn, and the start of winter to recuperate from their hard slog was a good idea. On their way to Jerusalem, they were able to trade with local tribes. They were also able to get sea support from other crusaders. This support would be crucial for the siege of Jerusalem. From these support ships, crusaders were able to get supplies for siege towers. The siege lasted from the 7th of June until the 15th of July. As many of you know, the taking of Jerusalem was completed with the bloody slaughter of most of its Muslim and many of its Jewish inhabitants. There was a story of Kurt Hose being offered the crown of Jerusalem, but turning it down due to laziness. Based on everything I've shared about him, I don't think laziness was a problem. Maybe a bit too much piety and bad timing. He was never offered the crown, and in August began his trip home. He reached Conversano by winter. At 50, he finally found a worthy bride. Now, Kurt Hose hadn't been a chaste man. He had at least three illegitimate children, but he hadn't had any luck in the marriage department. With Sybil of Conversano, he found someone who was available to marry him, and by all accounts, beautiful, intelligent, and kind. Her father also offered a dowry worthy of a son of William. Kurt Host would have the funds to pay his brother back. His claim to England would be made stronger once he and Sybil had children, since Rufus was not one to marry. Rufus and Henry received the news that their brother was returning in the summer of 1100. They would not have been pleased. Kurt Host would be returning a crusading hero. Plus, he had the funds he needed to secure Normandy. Henry would probably see his chances of any inheritance slipping away. But unlike his brothers, Henry had great timing and was very lucky. On August the 2nd, 1100, William Rufus was killed in the New Forest. I told you, it was unlucky. The details are fuzzy, mainly because everyone of note who was present literally ran away after the event. Rufus was either hit by a misaimed arrow or fell onto one lodged in the ground. Henry followed what was about to become Norman tradition and rode to Winchester, securing the treasury. Much like Rufus before him and Stephen after him, Henry used his hold on the treasury to secure the throne. Lanfranc had been dead for more than a decade, but Rufus had appointed a successor, one of the few ecclesiastical appointments he made. Anselm, Lanfranc's successor though, had been exiled to France after one of his and Rufus's arguments. Henry might have been worried. His older brother could appear at any moment, or worse, he could have found Anselm on the continent and gotten himself crowned there. Henry wasn't taking any chances. 
He rode 110 kilometers to London in less than 24 hours. He quickly assembled the available barons. Not the leading ones, just the ones he could find. He then convinced Bishop Maurice, the Bishop of London, to crown him, not even waiting for the other archbishop in York to get to London. Henry managed to take the kingdom in only three days. To further protect his claim, he told Anselm to avoid Normandy on his return to England. Curthus would return to Normandy, a respected crusader, married to an amazing woman, ready to rule his duchy, only to find out his younger brother had beat him to England. Again. Even worse, Curthus had many supporters in England who would have pushed for his cause, but Henry's swift action prevented anyone from stepping in until the deed was already done. The anointing of a king provides him with protection in canon law. It became a religious violation to overthrow him without ecclesiastical dispensation. But in many ways, Henry's betrayal was just as illegal in canon law. This wasn't the same thing as Rufus had done 12 years earlier. This was a violation of Henry's oath made as a witness to Rufus and Curthouse's 1088 treaty and the expectation to protect the rights of crusaders when they were away. One of Curthouse's rights was as the heir of Rufus. If becoming the King of England was really about who could get to Winchester first and persuading the ranking bishop to crown you, then any descendant of William of Normandy can race for the kingship. This will end up hurting those that Henry cares for greatly. I need to step away from Curthouse's narrative to speak about Henry exclusively for a few moments. Their stories will be intertwined for almost the rest of their lives at this point. Henry's propaganda around his ascension looks like the invention of PR. Claiming the barons elected him, like an Anglo-Norman Witan, was honestly humorous. Sure, if we only count the barons that were in the room when it happened, you were elected, Henry. A Witan was a publicly occurring event that the leading elderman knew would be happening in advance. His second claim was that he was the only son who had been born in the purple, an idea that has no support in the inheritance laws of the Franks, Norse, or English. Poor phyrogeniture was a little-used practice in the Byzantine Empire. It was usually used as an excuse to pass over older sons from an earlier marriage in favor of younger sons of the current empress. Usually those older sons would also be disfigured in some way. Cutting of the nose was a notable favorite. This was not something that he pressed multiple times. Henry's choice of bride was an actual stroke of genius. These days, we prefer to marry for love, or at least like. But marriages of kings in this time were political matches, and there was no woman with more political clout than Edith of Scotland. She was the oldest daughter of Malcolm III of Scotland and St. Margaret of Wessex. Margaret's ancestors were the kings of England before 1066. Her grandfather was Edmund Ironside. She was a direct descendant of Alfred the Great. By marrying Edith, who would change her name to Matilda, I'll refer to her as Edith Matilda in this and future episodes. Henry was able to graft the Anglo-Saxon tree onto the Norman tree. His Anglo-Saxon subjects, still the majority of his populace, would have been pleased with this return of the royal house of Wessex. Her marriage would also help secure the borders with Scotland. She was the sister of the current and the future kings of Scotland. Her brother David even spent much of his youth in Henry's court. Finally, and most importantly for Curthose, she was his goddaughter. Curthus was a crusader and a pious man who took his vows seriously. Protecting one's godchildren was a sacred duty. Unlike his attempt to take England from Rufus, Curthus's plans to get it from Henry were better organized. He also had even more support this time. All of the Norman barons and most of the English barons were behind him, or in England waiting for him. They were also able to keep their plans secret until their ships launched. Henry may not have known there were actual plans in the works, but he wasn't a stupid man. He knew his brother couldn't have been happy, and he knew that the rebellion in 1088 had only not succeeded because the conspirators talked. With no one talking, he must have been worried. Henry was a more calculating man than either of his brothers. One of his calculations was that Winchester needed to be secure. He appointed William Gifford, his chancellor, to the bishopric. Even with his loyal appointment, Henry would have lost the kingdom if not for another churchman. Anselm, the almost 70-year-old Archbishop of Canterbury, had returned to England at Henry's request. His presence would be pivotal in the coming weeks. Curthus, his leading Norman barons and knights, and more than 200 ships left Normandy on the 20th of July, 1101. On their way, they were intercepted by a flotilla sent from England to stop them. Instead, the men were convinced to change sides and join Curthus. 
Curthouse wasn't going to subjugate the people of England. He was seen as their rightful king. He reached Winchester with minimal resistance. It really was looking as though nothing could stop him. Henry certainly wasn't going to manage it. Taking Winchester would have meant controlling the funds. More nobles would have left Henry's side if it weren't in his control. But either by planning or luck, there was something to stop Curthouse in Winchester. His goddaughter, Edith Matilda. Curtis was, as I've mentioned many times, a pious and chivalrous man. Attacking pregnant women who you've sworn to protect was not in his nature or practice. Based on the date of her daughter's birth, Edith Matilda would have been about four months along, so this would have been public knowledge. It's important to remember that Edith Matilda was also the niece of one of Curthouse's closest friends. Causing her injury, or worse, to miscarry, would have had grave personal and political consequences. Curthouse would no doubt regret his noble behavior and loyalty to honor. I don't know if Henry would have treated Curthouse's wife so well. He chose to remain outside of the walls of Winchester and await the arrival of Henry and his forces. His pause may also have been caused by his hope to avoid bloodshed with his own brother. Henry and his men arrived with their one trump card, Anselm. While Anselm may have preferred having the former crusader as king, he needed to uphold canon law. Henry had been anointed, a process which renders the anointee closer to God. Anselm would not support the usurpation of an anointed king without an ecclesiastical cause, and Henry hadn't given him one. Yet, sadly, Henry's timing was always good. While Rufus had always ignored the church and taken their money without pause, Henry had the good sense to keep the church on side when he needed it. Curthouse would not continue his rebellion in the face of excommunication. The brothers were able to negotiate, recognizing each other as heir in absence of a legitimate son. Curthouse surprisingly won that race by 10 months, since the child his goddaughter was carrying was a girl, the future Empress Matilda. Henry was to release all his Norman possessions and pay Curthouse a pension of 3,000 silver marks per year, more than one-tenth of the royal income a year. The lands of the dispossessed barons on each side of the channel were to be restored. Curthouse had less restoring to do than Henry. After agreeing to the terms, the brothers went to London together, and Curthouse would remain in his brother's court until September, returning to Normandy after Michaelmas. It looked so promising, but sadly, it would not end well. Curthouse and Sybil would welcome their only son, William Cleto, on the 26th of October, 1102. Cleto is a derivative of the word prince and the super K he was most known by. His cousin, William Adeline, would be born 10 months later. This is why I and historians for the last 900 years have had to use nicknames for the Normans. It's William, Matilda, and Roberts everywhere. Sadly for Curthouse and Clito, Sybil would die less than six months after the birth of her son. Some said she was poisoned and that Curthouse was in on it, but it's highly unlikely. Most likely she died due to any number of post-pregnancy infections that women died of prior to antibiotics and handwashing. Most scholars think mastitis becoming septic is the likely cause. Over the next years, there were many minor skirmishes in Normandy and political theater on both sides of the channel, while the brothers fought a cold war against each other. Henry's political acumen was obvious throughout. He would happily ignore portions of their treaty while reminding Curthouse of his own obligations under it. William of Malmesbury, in a moment of rare candor, states, Henry made promises with no intention of keeping them. Finally, in 1106, 40 years to the day after their father invaded England, Henry would defeat and capture his brother at the Battle of Tinchebray. After this loss, Curthouse would be paraded around Normandy before being taken to England for noble confinement. Historians are not sure of the facts surrounding Curthouse's son, Cleto, who was four at the time. Some claim that Henry, in a rare moment of having a heart, allowed his nephew to escape with his guardians, Cleto's half-sister, I cannot find a name for her, but she was just a woman and a bastard, and her husband, Hellas of St. Saints. Others state that he was outfoxed by Curthouse's supporters. He raced ahead of Henry's forces to warn Hellas and get the boy to safety. Hellas will remain loyal to Cletos for the remainder of the boy's life. Cletos and his loyal brother-in-law would continue pressing his father's claims. But William of Normandy's oldest son would spend the rest of his life in comfortable imprisonment. He would learn Welsh, at least well enough to write poetry. He had a good relationship with his jailer, Roger of Salisbury. 
which isn't surprising. Curtis was a personable man, and it appears that Henry did nothing to physically harm his brother. I'll come back to Curtis towards the end of this, but I need to leave him for now. Cleto, carrying on his father's and now his own cause, is a tragic story that needs looked at. Hellas and his sister kept him safe, and he was well-educated and trained as a knight. Cleto had the support of many Norman nobles and the new French king, Louis VI. Still young and not yet known by the super K, the fat. Don't think for a moment that Louis' support was out of the goodness of his heart. He didn't want a powerful opponent to be a large landholder in his country. Louis was the first king of the Franks to successfully begin the process of taking back central French control of French territory. Having Cleto, a man who owed him allegiance as the Duke of Normandy and possibly the King of England, was much more appealing than having Henry there. Remember, Normandy is a vassal to France. Theoretically, the Norman Duke owes allegiance to the French King. Well, in fact, it would take the removal of the English kings as Dukes of Normandy to make Normandy French. Louis was starting the process here. This support meant that Henry's hold on Normandy was never very secure. He regularly had to deal with uprisings and border disputes. Henry did better than most would have done in the same situation. By using his English income, he was able to arm and man his Norman armies. He was able to marry his amazing number of illegitimate children off to cement alliances with minor leaders of border regions. To further protect himself, he arranged the betrothal of his son, Adeline, to Matilda, the daughter of Falk, the Count of Anjou, a territory that caused him endless problems. Well into 1120, it looked like Henry would have his house in order, and Cleto would just be a footnote in history, the son of the former Duke of Normandy, who was cared for by his wealthy relations. Henry even managed to have Adeline recognized as heir-designate of Normandy, having his son swear fealty to Louis and taking away that support from Cleto. But history does not care about the plans you've made. And on the 25th of November, it reminded Henry that he didn't have as much control as he thought. That night, the white ship, carrying Adeline and two of Henry's illegitimate children, along with many of the young adult heirs to many powerful barons and knights in his kingdom, sunk. Don't drink and boat. The older members of the aristocracy and the very young were on other ships, but the white ship had turned into a party ship before it left port. I cover more of this disaster and its impact on Henry's plans in Empress Matilda's episodes, so I'll leave that story there. For Cleta, though, this disaster was a stroke of luck. According to the treaty Curthouse and Henry had signed, Curthouse was again Henry's heir. As his father's only heir, this meant Cleto's star was again rising. The nobles who had recently agreed to support Henry came back to his side. Louis was happy to give him his support again. Finally, he was able to arrange a marriage to Sibylla of Anjou in 1123. The bride was too young to consummate the marriage, but Cleto was still a young man himself and in no rush. He now had support of the French, Anjou, and many of the leaders of Normandy. Henry acted quickly to take some of the wind out of his sails. Too early for sailing jokes? In an amazing display of hypocrisy, Henry, well, bribed the Pope to annul Cleto's marriage on the grounds of consanguinity. His argument was that the couple were too closely related via their shared ancestors. Geoffrey I of Anjou, and his wife, Adele of Meaux, the parents of Cleto's great-great-grandmother, Ermengarde Gerberga of Anjou, and her brother, Falk III of Anjou, Sibylla's great-great-grandfather. Yes, that would be the same shared ancestors that William Adeline and Sibylla's sister had, and the same that Geoffrey of Anjou and Matilda will have. Good job, Henry. <laughs> Henry was good at throwing money at problems. He continued this in 1127. This year, Cleto was given land in the French Vexin by Louis and a new bride, Louis' sister-in-law. And in March that year, Louis gave him Flanders. Now, Cleto is one of the many heirs to the county, but having his indebted friend holding the contentious county would help Louis. So he was willing to send a small army there to make it happen. Henry used his funds to incite Cleto's rivals to rebel and to assist leading citizens to rise up. Cleto was forced to battle to maintain his county. He actually was doing very well. Like his father, he was good at leading troops and at military strategy. By July 1128, Cleto was retaking Flanders and had vanquished his strongest rival claimant. But on the 12th, he was injured at Alst. A wound to his arm during a minor scuffle became infected. This infection turned gangrenous, and on the 28th, at only 25 years old, Cleto died with Hellas by his side. 
Between the time of his injury and his death, he managed to write his uncle letters requesting the pardon of his men. He was posthumously enrolled as a monk at the Abbey of St. Burton, where he was buried. His uncle followed through on his final request, and Cleto's loyal soldiers either went to England to serve Henry or went to the Holy Land on crusade. The night his son died, Curthose is said to have dreamt of Cleto's death. No one would have known of his passing in England yet. Odric Vitalis says he resigned himself to his dream being fact and was not surprised when news reached him weeks later. Curthose would live for six more years, well into his 80s. He died less than two years before his much younger brother. The simple question of this series is meant to be, would the past have been a better leader than the person they were replaced with? So... Would Curthose have been a better king than Rufus or Henry? I think the answer to Rufus is yes. Hands down, Curthose kept his promises and was both a valiant military leader and a pious man, two things that are often difficult to manage at the same time. He also appears to have governed Normandy well during the time he was in charge. Rufus has his own PR problem, mainly due to his difficulty with the church, but he really wasn't that impressive of a king. Had Curthose's rebellion succeeded in 1088 and Rufus placed in regal prison until his death from old age, I think England would have been governed well by Curthose. The answer to Henry is maybe yes, maybe no. It would have been very different. Henry was a much more wily character than either of his brothers. He was willing to lie to your face if it would get him what he wanted. He was also a brilliant civil leader. His updates to the English system of taxation and governance are still discussed today. But in 1100, I don't think anyone knew what Henry would eventually become. He had spent time in his older brother's court, but he was an unknown. The barons rebelling against him was not surprising at all. They knew Curthos and respected him. Curthos was also much more collaborative and would probably have been more collaborative and conciliatory in his ruling. Henry's iron will held things together until it wasn't there to hold things together. Avoiding the anarchy would have been a gift to the general subjects of England. Henry II followed in his grandfather's footsteps as a controlling king who, through force of personality and will, held together his empire, which began to fall apart as soon as he died. Perhaps parliamentary power, at least for the lords, would have come about earlier and more peacefully under Curthos and Cleto. The Barons' War and the entire debacle that was Henry III's rule could have been avoided. Cleto presents another interesting point in the story. Had Henry not been trying to undermine him, his death at 25 would not likely have happened. Cleto and Curthouse also had something Henry does seem to lack a bit of. Charisma. Henry was an amazing king, but he often forced his barons and churchmen to do what he wanted, as you'll see in our next episodes. He didn't inspire the loyalty his brother and nephew did. Their men were loyal, and while politics got in the way at times, kings were willing to drop Henry quickly for them. Stephen would not likely have been able to take England if Cleto had been Henry's heir. Even if Cleto never had children and just acted as a historical stand-in until Henry II was an adult, England would have most likely been much better off. The anarchy, as I'll discuss more over the next three episodes, was disastrous for the economy and welfare of England. It benefited no one except England's enemies. I think Henry made a grave, purely emotional, and selfish mistake by not supporting his nephew as his heir, even more than Anselm made supporting Henry over Curthos. Granted, Henry didn't have 900 years of hindsight and many years of political philosophy to help guide him. He didn't know that his ultimate goal should have been to rule for the people he ruled over, not for the glory of his own house and name. I'd like to think we've changed since then, but with world events we're living through... I don't know. My sources other than the chroniclers for these episodes have been Catherine Lack. Her book, Conqueror's Son, presents a rehabilitative thesis of Kurt Hose and was invaluable. Thomas Asbridge's The First Crusades was helpful in discussing the Crusades. Next week, Empress Matilda, part one. She's made a few minor appearances in her uncle's story, but her story is huge. It will actually be divided into three episodes to avoid going too long for each. And this brings me to an important question for you, my listeners. How are you feeling about the length of these episodes? My goal is to keep intro episodes to no more than 20 minutes and the subject episodes to 30 minutes or less. Would you prefer longer or shorter? I'm really welcome to any feedback. I want to make this show enjoyable for you. As always, I would like to thank my husband. (laughs) I'd also like to thank Mike Duncan and Rex Factor for inspiring me. And finally, I'd like to thank you, the listener. Before I go today, I want to open up the floor for questions, follow-up, and clarifications. I would love to do an end of the mini series episode going forward. I'm stealing this idea from Robin Pearson of the History of Byzantium. His end of the century lookabouts are a great review. 
In future, I will try to include these immediately after the final episode of each miniseries, but this one may be a little later. So please get your questions to me as soon as possible. Thank you for listening to Past. I can be found on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at PastPod. That's P-A-S-S-E-D-P-O-D. Please feel free to email me at pastpod at gmail.com. I have a Patreon that can be found at patreon.com backslash pastpod.